Man, eggs and bacon and milk all over your game table. It looks like it would be good, though. I'm kind of hungry at this point. <laughs> it bugs me so much sometimes to see the milk splash off the meatballs yeah, onto yeah. the bun. <laughs> I, I, think, I think he specifically, because he used to change it up every week. Yeah, I think yeah, he specifically yeah, yeah. kept that one just because he knows I it makes know, people upset. probably true. Well, hey, welcome back to another live board game breakfast. I'm Sam Healy. I'm Roy Canning. And we are here without the dangerous duo, that of uh, Z and Tom. Oh, snap. They are in England right now. Now, I believe they are at Birmingham at uh, the UKGE. I mm -hmm. think uh, yesterday and the day before they were doing some touristy stuff, but uh, I believe the convention starts today. Yep, yep. So uh, if you are in England, you can go and uh, say hi to them and uh, make them feel bad they didn't take me. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Roy and I are headed out later on today, this afternoon, to uh, Atlanta. Not as fabulous, but we are going to be going to the CMON Expo this For weekend. Sure. So if you're going to be in the Atlanta area and you got some extra time on your hands, stop by and say hi. I'm sure the people at CMON would actually love to see you there as well. Yep, and definitely make sure to hit us up and say hi if you're there. Yeah, definitely. We uh, enjoy interacting with you guys, so please do so. Well, without further ado, let's go ahead and get into some of the news, shall we? All righty, so we've got the uh, Dice Tower news coming up here and a uh, couple of, you know, strange items. Uh, oh yeah, and uh, I haven't looked at this, so this, we'll see what uh, we'll see what's coming up. This first one, I think you knew about this first. We've talked about it in the office, but the first thing here is USAopoly has announced mm -hmm. Star Wars Dark Side Rising. Yeah, I really liked the Thanos Rising, um, <laughs> and it's kind of cool that it's Star Wars, but it's kind of weird at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just kind of did was somebody looking for this? Was somebody asking for it? Or I thought that he was going to be like here. traveling to the different planets and like blowing them up was going to be like yeah. the 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 exchange for collecting the Infinity Gems or whatever. Right. But it's actually like collecting Death Star parts gives him extra powers. <laughs> It's like, wait, what? Collecting Death Star parts. One of the interesting things about this, too, is I don't think it's actually going to be available in the U.S. at all. Yeah, it's only available in Europe or England, I believe. Um, uh, it says there, let me just uh, read it to you. There is mm -hmm. a rare non-FFG Star Wars themed game that has been announced, uh, USAopoly, uh, and Disney Consumer Products UK have oh, publicized so the, the pending release of Star Wars Dark Side Rising, a new cooperative card game and dice game that is set during the events immediately prior to and during Star Wars New Hope. Oh, It's episode four. Mm -hmm. So it's, in, it's after the Clone Wars and right before and during the uh, A New Hope, episode four. It's designed for two to four players, 10 and up, and has an estimated game time of 45 minutes. So each player is going to be, uh, let's see, where the mouse go, there it is. Each player is going to lead their own rebel cell, led by their starting team leader, and you have Cassian Andor, I believe he's from um, uh, Rogue, uh, Rogue One. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, Cassian Andor, Leia Organa, Princess Leia, Luke Skywalker, or Hera Syndulla. Hera Syndulla. That was, uh, I believe, one of the cartoon series. I would say you're way deeper into the Star Wars um, than I am. So. I'm pretty <laughs> sure, yeah. She was one of the cartoon series uh, ones. And they will work together to recruit other iconic characters such as Obi-Wan Kenobi, Admiral Raddus. Don't know who that is. Um, and prevent the construction of the original Death Star to thwart the Empire's overall plans for domination of the galaxy. So I guess you're not actually collecting parts mm -hmm. like the Infinity Jones. You're just simply stopping them from constructing the Death Star. Right. That makes, I guess, a little bit more sense. And I'm sure you're going to be, like, collecting the different characters from Star Wars or whatever, like yeah. like Data and Jordy and stuff like that. So the game will be released in the European, <laughs> Middle Eastern, and Africa regions in the fall. And it's unclear whether this game will be exclusive to that those regions or will receive North American release at a later date. So we don't know if it's coming over here, but we have, uh, like, the Carcassonne Star Wars game I don't think ever made it over. Right, yeah, yeah. So I don't know if that's because... 
people were like, huh? Why do we need a car goes on a Star Wars game? Well, or, I'm sure a fancy flight has the lockdown on the IP here <laughs> yeah. in, in, in America, but uh, yeah. they, they have different IPs over in other parts of the it's world. It's being showcased at the UKGE right now, so Tom and Zier may be taking a look at it. And then Distoy 2019 in London will also be showing it off as well. So that is Dark Side Rising. Nice. Uh, next, we have Foothills. Foothills is a two-player game that's based on Snowdonia, which was a hmm. uh, railway game um, back in, I think, what, 2012 or something like that. Uh, Tony Boydell designed Snowdonia. Uh, he has come back with Foothills with a co-designer, Ben Nateson, and uh, there are similarities between the two. Um, what it says here is that uh, it resembles Snowdonia regarding the theme and graphic design. Gotcha. Both games are about railways in Wales and are illustrated by renowned illustrator Clemens Franz. Additionally, there are some similarities in the game design too. The infamous pub, or the famous pub, has uh, its comeback, and the Welsh names are still unspeakable for everyone not living in Wales. <laughs> <laughs> it is advanced level, though. Yeah, advanced level. Does it actually say that? <laughs> it says that on the box. <laughs> the Snowdonia experience advanced level. Advanced level. All right. So uh, basically, you're going to be um, commandeering your teams of workers. Mm. I was reading another description on another website about this, and they were using a lot of, like, navvies. I don't know what navvies are, but um, maybe they're newbies or something like that. Um, it says control your navvies. I have no idea what a Navi is. Somebody can let us know that in the comments if you'd like, because that really has me kind of interested. But uh, anyway, uh, it's basically uh, a Snowdonia-inspired new game, uh, Foothills. And um, so it uh, utilizes an action selection mechanism with a twist. Once you have selected and carried out your action, you turn the card onto its backside, which allows a completely different action. Uh, and it also comes with variable setup. So only six out of the eight tracks are used in the game, giving you a wide variety of excitement for lots of games to come. Cool. So that's Foothills uh, coming out by, it looks like, what is that, Lookout, Lookout. Games? It's a two-player game by uh, Ben Batson and Tony Bordell. So that is Foothills. Next, A Pet's Life. <laughs> um, I don't believe this has anything to do with... That's that's the components for Foothills. I knew that. That was, I, that was planned. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A Pet's Life. A uh, Pet's Life is um, a reworking of Saikatsu. Um, Saikatsu, mm. you're dealing with uh, birds and flowers and gardens and stuff like that. And uh, in A Pet's Life, you're dealing with pets and pillows and couches and, and that type of stuff. Uh, so... Uh, uh, players are placing tiles containing a type of animal and a color of pillow upon which the animal is sitting in a shared living room. Upon placing the tiles, players will score for groups of the same type of animal. Then at the end of the game, players score rows with pillows of the same color. That's so, awesome. Huh. Um, I guess this is just a re-theming of Saikatsu, it looks like. Or it sounds like. I've never actually played Saikatsu, so... Does that, I don't know if that sounds very similar or not, but as a player count of one to four, and it's due to be released in August. You get pets and pillows. Of 30, uh, August 30th, 2019. So that is Saikatsu Pets Life. Next, Board and Dice have announced a new title in their line of escape room games called Escape Tales Low Memory. According to their announcement, this game will be premiered at Essenspiel. 2019. Uh, you don't need to have played any previous Escape title, Tales titles uh, Awakening prior to playing this new version, but the new game features more cards that add more riddles to the game and three stories, but only one plot, which features three different characters, allowing the players to play the game for three different perspectives. Oh, that's actually really interesting. Yeah. And it's also a cyberpunk future. That's really cool. So it's uh, probably dystopian. That's usually what cyberpunk is. But uh, it's a lot of technology involved. Oh, yeah. Definitely want to check that one out because I really like escape room games. And it's cool that they're adding in the characters to it more like time stories-ish, I think. Mm -hmm. That's kind of yeah. cool. That'll be cool. All right. So that is Escape Tales Low Memory from Board and Dice. Next, there is a spotlight uh, for the cast of uh, Above Board Television. 
Mm -hmm. uh, this is a sh special uh, that features about a dozen or so actors, um, and they have a special knowledge of sketch comedy. Gotcha. Uh, and they all work together, playing off of each other in a natural manner while attending the studio filming. This is Tom writing this, I believe. I was able to speak to each cast member and get their take on the show, board games, and the community at large. Um, so there is a... This is a kind of a... What was the, uh, the, the, the car show in England? Uh, Top Gear. Top Gear. This is yeah. being billed as the Top Gear of board games. Gotcha. The board games hobby. So... Um, I don't know if everybody's building it that way, but uh, we have some uh, different people here as far as the uh, different people that are there. Um, the production creates a meta of the show with actors using their real names and often their real jobs. You get to know the characters they portray, and from the picked on intern Curtis to psychotic Kurt the sound guy. Kurt the sound guy is the, the, this guy right here. And it's really kind of creepy that his picture is next to mine. Because we have so many similarities in our appearance. Uh, Wait, that's I, not a picture of you? <laughs> shut up. <laughs> um, I actually met this guy at Gen Con, and, and he's he's quite taller than I am. Gotcha. But the face is very very similar. But and and the guys on the show are, are give him mm -hmm. give him guff about that. Yeah, all the Tom time. did a vlog for the above board stuff when he went really? over there, yeah. and it and it was pretty cool. I'm excited to see the finished product of uh, mm -hmm. this. It I bet it'll be really great. But uh, there is uh, Brett, the hopeless, possibly homeless victim of destiny. Ideas, gags, characters come around on a second and third time, creating inside jokes that make the viewer feel like they are part of the hysterical, dysfunctional family. Um, producer, writer, director Travis Oates was the owner and teacher of uh, a Acme Comedy Theater in L.A., and he trained a lot of the cast of Above Board in sketch and improv comedy. Oh, nice. Uh, and he was also host of Arena on G4, director of Don't Blink, and has been the official voice of Piglet for Disney for more than 15 years. Mm -hmm. So you've heard his voice if you've watched anything that had Piglet in it for the last 15 years. Nice. Interesting. All right, so uh, that's you, you can check out more about what Tom wrote on our uh, website, Dice Tower News. Uh, but uh, it seems like an interesting take, and they are putting a lot of work into it, and it looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. So that is the Above Board TV show. Uh, next, Asmodee has announced the launch of the GameGenic Studio, which has declared its mission to be delivering, quote, amazing accessories that protect, support, and enrich players' experiences, end quote. So we're talking... Um, I would imagine dice. I would imagine other kinds of gaming supplies. I wonder um, if they're going to take over like a lot of the sleeves and things like that that Fantasy I Flight did before. I believe that's part of it, but I don't know how the... I mean, it's Asmo Day, so I don't right. know if the Fantasy Flight stuff is just going to be melded into and the packaging Or if it's going to be gonna completely change. different stuff for different right. board games. Right. So uh, I, we don't know a whole lot about this, but it's going to be headed up by Adrian Alonso, the man behind the Ultimate Guard products. So oh, okay. There you go. Uh, Game Genic Studio is going to be responsible exclusively for gaming accessories such as traditional sleeves, gotcha. deck boxes, play mats, and dice sets. It also promises to add new class to the market with accessories for ga various games and licensed products. I always, it always makes me nervous when they s people say things like that. Mm -hmm. We're bringing class to this. <laughs> Well, it's that's you know not. I'm not going to say it's pretentious, I guess, but it it's assuming a lot. Yeah. But I don't know. Maybe they just mean we're we're bringing a new, you know, I don't know. If they of if they start making a lot more like play mats, like to replace boards or like replacement play mats for boards, yeah. I think it's really cool. I really enjoy like the play mats for games. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, it makes picking things up off of them a lot easier. Yeah. Um, they don't store very well though. Unless, right, that, that's the problem is it's so hard. Unless game companies start making their boxes so that they can. And that would be amazing, but it's so hard to roll yeah, up a play mat. And, is, but if is. you designed it with the game in mind, maybe mm -hmm. they could make that happen. Yep, that's true. All right, so that is Game Genic Ingenious Supplies by Asmodee. Next, we have some comic books that are coming up. Comic books oh, in the Starcadia Quest universe has been announced by IDW Games. They're going to come out with a mini series, just three comic books in the Starcadia Quest universe. Um, 
Uh, it's going to be done by James Roberts, who is the author of Transformers, More Than Meets the Eye, and Lost Light. Hmm. I don't know either of those. I don't read comic books that often. Right, right. So uh, it will take uh, readers, along with Star Kid and his freelance adventuring crew, deep into the frontier. According to Roberts, quote, there's a lot of world building, lots of emotion, lots of shocks, but ultimately the story carries itself forward on a wave of old fashioned heroics. Yeah. Old school science fiction with a modern twist, a mashup of classic space opera tropes and gleefully weird twists and turns. Most of all, it's fun. Uh, each issue, this is another thing for you gamers out there, each issue of Starcadia Quest will include exclusive playable game content. Oh, <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. Cha-ching! <laughs> <laughs> um, it's kind of funny because this is like some of those, like Arcadia Quest and things like that are some of those things where it's like, oh man, the, the, the exclusives yes, and things like that, yes, it's going to have those guys try to jump all over it. So. Oh man, I need so. that one weapon card or I need that one character card. <laughs> That's right. But basically, it'll, uh, it'll, these things will incorporate elements of the comic storyline into Starcadia Quest's tabletop hmm. play. So uh, that's an interesting little marriage between Simon and IDW. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, lo the artwork looks good just from the cover. I, I like that style, but uh, we'll just have to see. Uh, next, we have Deadly Doodles. Deadly Doodles by Steve Jackson Games. Each player mm. is given a dungeon board. Each board features a set of printed elements, such as bags of gold, a dragon, in monsters, every turn players will flip over four cards that show different paths. The players draw those paths on their boards, scoring points based on the elements they pass through. Trap tiles placed on one player's board can affect the board of other players. The player with the most points at the end wins. Uh, it's for one to four players, ages eight and up, plays in about 15 minutes, and is selling for $19.99. It will pre-release at Origins ahead of its wider, or rather broader, August release. Uh, it was designed by Sam Mitschke mm -hmm. and Randy Schooneman, designers behind the recent Origins Award Super Kitty Bug Slap. Those are four words that I didn't ever think would be put together. <laughs> Super Kitty Bug Slap. Uh, that was a, 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 a Origins Award nominee, not winner. I, I think I said winner. But, uh, huh, I guess it's a kind of roll and write, but not really. Or it's like card a, draw it's and draw. It's a flip and write, draw, yeah. right. A flip and write. That's interesting. They call it a write and write. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. They call it a write and write? It's something like that. <laughs> okay. Well, that would be eccentric of them to do so. All right, so that's Deadly Doodles from Steve Jackson Games coming uh, pre-release at Origins. And now we have Finger Guns at High Noon. Three, two, one, go! We may have just played this live we yesterday. We just played this live on Tuesday. Uh, yesterday. Was, was it yesterday? yesterday? No, that's two, oh, days it's ago. two days ago. Two days ago. Man, yeah. time flies. Yeah, time, time's, time's fun when you're having flies. That's what my, uh, band, my middle school band teacher used to say. There you go. Uh, any boards and cards will release Finger Guns at High Noon this June. Hey, it's a... That's <laughs> red rhymes. Uh, it uh, basically puts players in the role of gunslingers in the Wild West. Uh, you go through a negotiation phase, deciding on what actions to take for the round. I don't think we did that in our playthrough, the negotiation phase. Uh, or maybe it was just a lot quicker. Like, I'm going to shoot you. Shoot Please you. don't. No, I'm going to. Yeah, um, I guess you could talk about what you're going to do yeah. first. Uh, but then, you know, the, the, when, it, when any player says three, two, one, shoot, then you have to put up a, 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 a hand gesture yeah. of some kind. And there are specific hand gestures that you can use. It's not just willy nilly, Chris. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when, uh, when a player's total life reaches zero, you start with 20 health. Uh, you know, if you get shot like this, then it's. Uh, Two. Two. If you get shot with this, it's six. But you have to not be shot yourself right. for that to work. Yeah, There's yeah. a lot of like There's a pa little... paper, rock, scissors-ish. But yes. then it's also, I feel like it'd be interesting with a big group because then right. you could maybe not get hit. With just the three of us, it was like <laughs> you every, got hit every yeah, single every round. Single time, yeah. <laughs> uh, so you, whenever your player's life reaches zero, they become a ghost. And ghosts can, can still be in the game and work together mm -hmm. uh, to take out the remaining players. But uh, uh, they can actually still win 
So you don't want to make too much of a uh, enemy yeah, while the game's the going on. Yeah, to take out all the living players at once. There you go. They can actually win. Nice. So it's uh, three to eight players, 14 and up, and uh, MSRP of $15. It's planning to be released on June 26th. So there you have that. I think we've got some contributors set up for you. Kickstarter and Wargame News. Let's see it. Hello, fellow gamers. So this week we're going to be at the Cool Mini or Not Expo. So if you are in town and at the expo, make sure to stop by and say hi. We're also going to be checking out some sweet, sweet Kickstarters there because they have Bloodborne and God of War coming up and Truving, I think it is. I'll have to check that one out as well. But we're also going to be hosting the live panels there. So I'm super excited about it as we will get first-hand knowledge from the designers about those games. And you guys can join us live. It's going to be amazing. And there's one other thing I was supposed to mention. What was it? Oh, yeah. Kickstarters this week. Let's take a look. Featured this week, we have that one game by Elizabeth Hargrave and illustrated by Beth Sobel that you just can't quite get your hands on. That's right, it's Tussie Mussy by Button Shy Games, which is for one to four lovers of Victorian history who are interested in the ultimate battle of wits, where you decide if your opponent would put the lousy card facing up for you to see, or did they hide the awful thing face down, knowing that only a great fool would ever take what they've been given for about 20 minutes, as players will be trying to collect sets of pretty flowers, all while probably quoting the Prince's Bride for the remainder of the night. A pledge for this pocket game comes in at $10. Next up, we have the working title of my Memoirs of Motherhood with... The Goblin King is Angry by Ion Games. This is for two to six adult goblins scrambling across the gridded kingdom to appease their little king by strategically attacking towers and releasing the hordes for 45 minutes. All while, you know, being a goblin, making yourself look super strong and important. I mean, sometimes you just need to trip a few other goblins to get ahead in the world, you know? A pledge for this tower attack game starts at $35. Now, speaking of grids and attacking towers, we have... Sky Tier by PvP Geeks. This MOBA style game is for two to eight warlords looking to draft heroes and create the most synergy on the field by using strategic tactics on the battlegrounds, as well as combined deck building for about 45 minutes. A starting price for this game is $62. And lastly, we have the third extension in the Mystia universe with Ikion by Tabula Games, which is certainly a mouthful to say for this standalone game in its series. This is for two to five seekers looking to collect artifacts across the land while trying to avoid parasites and monsters for 90 to 120 minutes in this engine building Euro style game that costs $108. Thanks so much for joining me this week, guys. If you want to know more about any of the Kickstarters that you saw here today, then join me at gloryhound.com as we maybe quite possibly do a show. I guess we'll see if we can fit it all in. However, we will be releasing our favorite picks for the week there. And if you are gaming at UK Games Expo or you're going to Cool Mini or Not Expo or you're maybe in a convention in your hometown or just in your own house, make sure you're having lots of fun and have an amazing time this weekend. We will see you guys all next week. Today, this month, we're going to Tiny Battle Publishing. You know, you're probably saying to yourself, ah, how does this guy know all these little companies? It's who you know, man. Oh, how about that guy Dan? Sounds like one of my goombas from New York. Maybe. You know, in our circle, we call him the Prez. Yeah, I know, Sam, Z. They're tough guys. I, mean, I wouldn't want to mess with a guy like Sam, you know? And they got the head honcho. Hey, I'm Tom Vassell. That guy's one guy to worry about. Ah, I'm not too worried. If he gives me any trouble, I sent her. <laughs> it's them loopy people you gotta be scared of. And you know what's great about these small companies like Tiny Battle Publishing? Is that they want to make a name for themselves. So, they create games that are accessible, not expensive at all. Look, and usually these small companies attract big name designers. Like Herman Lutman. Why? The designer has the freedom to do what they want to do. In big you know what their logo is? This is their logo. Tiny package, big fun. Are we having fun yet? You know, they also have a print and play option at War Game Vault. Probably half price. This is the time to get into war games. You want to get into war games? Get into war games. This is it. You know, war games doesn't have to be that stereotypic soldier getting off the boat on the beach. No. You could be a space marine in the 1950s, like those campy movies, like this. 
invaders from Dimension X from the designing dream team Lutman and Manzo. Where you're a space marine, you go to another planet to take care of hostile aliens. Lots of stuff happens. Lava, guns, fun stuff. And here's the dream team again. Space vermins from beyond. This time, you're the same space marines, but you're taking care of bugs. And bugs, well, they're different. You see the pattern here? Same design team, same campy 1950s style. I mean, aliens, bugs, what could be next? Attack of the 50-foot Colossi. Yep, rock monsters. You got it. Same marines, different monsters, made out of rock. New Schwabenland. Germans, the Arctic, and aliens in World War II. You know, like I said before, war games need not be that stereotypic thing, soldier against soldier. Could be soldier against monsters. Could be monsters against monsters. You know, with war game mechanics in it. But if you do want to get into a serious conflict simulation, a war game, they got that too. Next week, we're going to check out a Rainbow Six type game called Tango Down Man-to-Man -Man Urban Combat. Welcome to the world of Tiny Battle Publishing. Thank you for watching, and if you want to know more about war games, please check out my channel, No Enemies Here. <clears throat> Alright, well hey, welcome back to another segment of Gamer Stereotypes. This one is called the Pseudo Gamer. This was, uh, I actually crowdsourced a bunch of, um, uh, gamer stereotypes from mm -hmm. you guys. And uh, this is one of the ones that was submitted. The pseudo gamer. This is the guy that shows up yeah. to most game nights, if not all of them, and he wants to play one specific game mm -hmm. every single time. Gotcha. And he. Blood Rage? No. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> not good games. No, he, he shows up at every game night. He wants to play one specific game mm -hmm. more often than not. And on top of that, if nobody wants to play that game, he'll sit there until somebody sits down to play a game with him. He will not play other games. <laughs> he will have his game set up, ready to go, and he'll wait for people to sit down. And, and, and It's not that he isn't nice. And it's not that he isn't welcoming or inviting or anything like that. It's just that he doesn't want to play anything else but this game. Gotcha. Um, we've had people that at our games. So not only does this. he own, not want to play other people's games, but he only wants to play this specific yes. one. He doesn't have a plethora of his games to give people the option. Right. Of. It's like, this is the game. Correct. Correct. And that's what makes this guy a little bit different than everybody else. Gotcha. Because most people will come in, they'll bring their, you know, a, a small cadre of games with them. Right, 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 right. To give people a choice. You know, well, these are the ones that I would like to play. Which ones would you like to play? Mm -hmm. That type of thing. But nah, this guy brings in one game, and this is the game that he's going to play tonight. Now, the, some of the people that have come to our game nights in the past uh, that have been like this, mm -hmm. they've also sometimes played, you know, sometimes they, uh, some nights rather, they have played other people's games. Gotcha. But you really kind of had to shoehorn them into doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, come on, there's nobody else here. You know, it's just us. Let's just play mm -hmm. this game. Oh, okay, is it, is it fast? That's one of the things. <laughs> That's one of the things. Is it a quick game? Because they don't they don't want somebody, while they're playing this game, they don't want somebody to come look at their game and want to play it, and they won't be able to teach it. <laughs> you know, it's one. <laughs> That's how they are. So, I mean, uh, I, I don't know that this is necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of, just kind of an eccentric thing, right? I've totally brought a game to game night and set it up and been like, all right, let's play this game. But if it wasn't happening, like gone into play a game with somebody else mm -hmm. or done something like that, mm -hmm. but I'd never bring the same game. It's sort of like, I haven't played this game in a really long time. I'd love to get it off the shelf. Like, right. like the, yeah. let's make it happen. Right. And a lot of times if you have a game set up, it's mm -hmm. easier to get to the table. But it's kind of interesting, like the guy who's like, this is the game we're playing. This is my favorite game of all time. This is the only game we can play. That's kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah, but you invite people over to your house to do that, though, right? Yeah, but I, it's normally <laughs> always it's normally always like a specific game. Yeah. And I'll be like, yo, do you want to play Batman? <laughs> hey, do you want to play Twilight Imperium? Yeah. And I get the people that right. come in knowing what they're going to play. Right. And it's already set up and ready to go. Yeah. But it's never like every single week the same game because I... I don't play the same game every single week. Well, Kabuki Kid said this is almost the prototyper. Uh, the guy who shows up with their prototype game and pushes everyone to try it out and has no other purpose for being there. That is a different person. Yeah, yeah This yeah. person does want to play 
an established game. He's not bringing a prototype. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. There's a difference. Um, some people are just not comfortable trying new things, Jonathan McNulty says. Uh, that's true. Um, yeah, yeah. They find something that they really enjoy. They know they're going to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And they want to kind of spread that love, so to speak. So, yeah, I get that. What games have you seen this done with? Uh, oh, what was it? Um... I'm you guys said there was a guy who was like super was. into Munchkin oh, all the time. Yes, and that's just it. Always had Munchkin on the table, and you just be it like, was some uh, kind of version of Munchkin. Sorry, yeah. man. <laughs> yes, some kind of version of Munchkin. But see, here's the thing: he would get people to sit down and play with him, mm -hmm. and the, from what I could tell, they were having a blast. Yeah. So it's it's not like he's making people play a game and then they're not having fun; they're enjoying it. It's just that his he's got like you know horse that is his on. game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Sam calls, not me, the, in chat, Sam says, I call this the Eurogamer. This has been my experience <laughs> with hardcore Eurogamers, uh, Chris. They don't uh, want to play anything but the Euro game they brought, and other games are inferior. Not true. Would you like to chime in on that, Chris? Other games are, while inferior. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear him. He says, like, while other games are inferior, yes, that's true. No, Chris Chris plays other games as well. He's he's uh, he's pretty good. I must say, I haven't seen Chris play a year game once, so I think he's lying to us. But that uh, might be because I forced him to play other games, so it's whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, John McNulty says there's a difference between a person who only likes one style of game and a person who only likes one game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a difference there. Um, uh, Katan, we have a group here that won't play anything else. Neo Closet Aku says that. Uh, sounds like me and Dominion. <laughs> <laughs> somebody says, uh, and I say somebody because Kr Krastio Krastev. I don't, I don't know if that's a play on words. I'm very. Listen, if you change anyway. up the, the the cards in Dominion, it's a different game, then, right? No, <laughs> no. Uh, so anyway, that is uh, the stereotypes. I'm not seeing a whole lot of other chat here in the in the uh, comments here. Uh, oh, the Schleppo says I think a better name would be the Mono Gamer. <laughs> Single game. <laughs> but anyway, that's the pseudo gamer segments here on Board Game mm -hmm. Breakfast. So let's get back to some more contributors. Hey there, I'm Jen, the board game librarian, flipping some pages and pushing some cubes with my segment from the page to the table. This week I am looking at Revolutionary Road by Richard Gates, a book I recently finished for a book club. Set in the 1950s and written in the 1960s, this is a deeply critical look at what is the perfect life. What is the perfect life in suburbia? We have Frank and April Wheeler here who have moved from New York City to basically what is Greenwich, Connecticut with their two children. They're looking for the perfect life. But as Yates says about this, what are they sacrificing in, in by doing that? Uh, he calls it their spiritual birthright. What are they not saying to each other in terms of their relationship, in terms of life? And there's deep ramifications in this book by doing that. You could also even say it's very modern as well, because, you know, there is that quote unquote, you know, perfect life in suburbia. We're all looking for the, the best, you know, home, the best neighborhood, the best friends. But are we being true to ourselves? I've ironically put together with this, welcome to your perfect home, one to 100 players, 25 minutes. So here we have your perfect home and your perfect neighborhood. You can almost imagine Frank and April living in a welcome to neighborhood. You are trying by using the flip and write uh, system that we have in this game of filling in um, each street and getting certain points from bonus cards. It's interesting too because one of the characters in here is a real estate agent and you can kind of see her almost, you know, finagling the welcome to your perfect home. Really love Revolutionary Road. It's a modern classic that I feel like doesn't get a lot of attention. That's all this week. Happy breakfast. Greetings and welcome to the Mega Meeple. I'm Thomas Grogan. I have a inclusive policy at my game table. I welcome everybody. I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat or conservative or liberal or progressive, straight, gay, Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, atheist, white, 
black, Asian, everyone is welcome at the Mega Meeple gaming table. But there are some people that I have to exclude. Certain attitudes and views that are not welcome at the Mega Meeple gaming table. Things such as racists, misogynists, bigots, sexual predators. And yes, I have had to exile on more than one occasion people that could not or would not hold a rein on those per perspectives. Case in point, I'm an atheist. Does that mean I do not welcome religious people or spiritual people at my game table? No, not at all. Come. The whole aspect of getting together the game is to have fun. The common denominator of all of us is we like board gaming. We like to play games. But if someone comes to my gaming table and starts uh, spouting off a uh, hate speech, because that kind of stuff is not welcome. So you see, being inclusive to everyone does not necessarily mean that you welcome anyone. Now, does that make me a gatekeeper? If so, then yes, I am a gatekeeper. And I make absolutely zero apologies for it. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I hope you're enjoying your board game breakfast. Today I want to talk about a relatively rare experience for me in gaming, which is when I'm really sad to finish one. So one of my absolute favorite solo games is Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. It's so much one that I really enjoy that I've actually put off solving the last two cases in the box for a couple of years because I'm just not really ready to let go. Um, but now that I'm decluttering and kind of getting ready to lighten my, my load in terms of how many games I have, I think that I'm ready to finish this game and let it go to someone else who will enjoy all of the mysteries for the first time. Because unlike a game that has a whole lot of replay value, once you know who the murderer is or who stole something or whatever, it's not as exciting as it was the first time. But what made me want to reflect on this is that it doesn't happen that often in board games. I've definitely had books that I didn't want to end, or I've been watching movies that I didn't want to stop watching because I was so into the world. But in board games, I think that that's more rare. Although now that we live in an age of legacy games or games that have more of a campaign narrative, maybe that is more common. So I want you to tell me in the comments, is there a game that you've been reluctant to finish because you've been having such a good time with the story that you're not quite ready to let go? So let me know and happy gaming. Alrighty, so here we are, back with a segment that I know literally very not very you know nothing about. Uh, it's called Game of Tones. So Chris has put together Chris, a game for us. Yeah, I this did. is to replace Ten for Ten because he's not here. Well, so. there's no replacement for Ten. No, for this 10. is definitely this is replacing. <laughs> Matter of fact, we're gonna make Z do this when he gets back. Okay, so basically, I was trying to figure out something game related, but that fit your guys' niche. The three of us are painters. Okay, yeah. Um, and so we know that Citadel, those guys are, are the Games Workshop people, they are kings at coming up with cool names for stuff. <laughs> yes. Like instead of calling their red paint red, it is blood for the blood god. Oh man, I was hoping that was going to be one of it them. It is not. I would say that would be way too easy to guess though. Yeah, and that, and so that, that's a really cool name. So I put together a little game here mm -hmm. with uh, you guys have to guess if it's a Citadel paint color or an obscure film. I was going to try to do obscure board games, but I figured that might be too easy. So yeah, yeah. we went with films. So um, I've hidden both of your guys' keys. The winner gets theirs back. Oh. <laughs> Joyous. So Mine are totally in my pocket. We'll just, <laughs> we'll just go through these, and I'll just have you guys both guess. If you're right, you get a point. If you're wrong, you lose a point. And awesome. And we'll attempt to math at the end here and see if I can get this all straight. So the first one up is... Dark Reaper. Dark Reaper. Uh, I'm gonna go with uh, 
I'm going to go with, uh, this is a Citadel paint. I'm going to go with movie. All right. Sam is correct. <laughs> Oh, take it. I didn't know Kennedy. if they'd have Reaper in their name since Reaper is a different paint. They make their own paints. So yeah. I was just like, eh, we'll make it. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Cool, cool. Right. XV88. XV88. What? Oh, XV88. That sounds like a, you said a, a movies, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, either an obscure film or a Citadel paint color. And I tried not to do like the technicals or the texture paints. They're layers or bases gotcha. or dry brushes. Okay. Um, to, yeah. I'm, I'm going with um, buh, buh. I'm going with obscure movie title. I'm going to go with movie as well. You're both wrong. Aww. <laughs> what is it? Literally, it's just XV88 it is base. poop brown. That's what it looks like. <laughs> so instead of poop brown, they just did XV88. XV, they didn't XV want to write poop brown, so they put <laughs> XV88. That would have been a great name. They're all, <laughs> literally, they're just all Citadel paints. <laughs> I thought about doing that. <laughs> I think Deadlock. it has to be a movie at this point. Deadlock. Yeah, that's that's got to be a movie. All right, you're both correct. This is a 1970 uh, uh, thriller western about bank robbers or something. Oh, and these are also highly rated films <laughs> on the, IMDb. So. It, it looks highly rated. <laughs> are you uh, serious about that? Are you being like facetious? No, no yeah. They, they it has them. six out of eight stars. And, uh, wow. 6.8 out, uh, no, out of 10. 6. 6. 8 8. Yeah, so they're all... Six out of eight doesn't even make sense. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Brass Scorpion. That's, uh, that's definitely Citadel paint. Ah. Uh, yeah. All right. Good yeah, because I actually think I might actually have this made. <laughs> All right. Eyes Without a Face. That's a movie. Yeah. That does that's sound got, like, that's gotta that be a sound movie. like something Citadel would name the paint. All right, yeah, you're both correct. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was about to say, that would be really weird. Plus, it's a song. Eyes Without a Face. Yeah, I this is a 1960s. That Billy Idol? That's Billy Idol, is isn't it? it? That's a Billy Idol song, yeah. This is a 1960s horror movie about a surgeon who tries to replace his daughter's face after a disfigurement. I wonder if he wrote that song based on this movie. Maybe. Could be. Emerald Forest. Definitely paint. Paint. You are both wrong. That is a movie. What? what? This is a 1985 that is, movie. That's starring... too. Oh, that's right. That's too tame for a Citadel name. That's too like, you know, nah. pixels and flowers and bunnies. That's too. Except the paint color I almost used was used was called Death World Forest. Yeah, but Death World Forest, not Still. Emerald Forest. Well, not uh, Follow the there, Epic Road. There are, there are elves world. in... <laughs> there could be happiness in no, Warhammer. No, there is no happiness. There's only war. Emperor's Children. Oh, uh, dude, come on. Why'd you do uh, this? That Emperor's seems, that seems that doesn't like it's... It seem like they would call it... It could be a flesh tone, though, though, right? But the problem is, it seems like the fact that he used Emperor means that he's gonna like use it he's trying to make us think it's a paint uh, because of emperors i'm gonna say movie me too that is a paint oh, <laughs> it was too close that's not even a flesh tone what is why that? why are so his weird. children so purple i know <laughs> we know the answer to that like, question isn't that the like the shayish aren't they that kind of paint that seems like it's know. too obvious sure uh, Trixie, Chris. Malpertuis. Oh, yeah. What? Oh, it's movie. Paint. Sam is correct. <laughs> Sam has got me wrecked in this. He has way more points than me. I don't know about that. Uh, well, you, what is this about? This is a, a young sailor finds himself trapped in the labyrinthine mansion of his occultist uncle, along with a number of eccentric and mysterious relatives who all seem to be harboring a deep secret. Yeah, this oh, is an snap. Orson Welles movie. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. Or he at least started. I don't know if he wrote it, but he was in it. Yeah. Cool. Breaker Morant. Or Morant. Breaker Morant. Hmm. It's obscure enough where it could be a paint color. Um, I'm going to say paint. I will go against that flow. I'm going to say movie. 
Sam is correct. Yes! I, I figure I was just trying to make it so you get all of the points as opposed to me. Yeah, this is a uh, World is War that One. Alfred? It looks like him, but I don't believe it is. It just. Uh, it looks like unless Alfred. He, unless he had a very small part in it and they did that thing where, oh, he's a big star now, so we'll put him on the cover even though he's only in the movie for two Three minutes. Australian <laughs> lieutenants, or I'm sorry, lieutenants, lieutenants. are lieutenants. court-martialed for executing prisoners as a way of deflecting attention from war crimes committed by their superior officers. It's always the superior officer's yeah. fault. It actually sounded like an interesting movie, almost like that... Uh, Gallipoli movie, Gallipoli. like other takes on World War One and Two, not just the U.S. perspective. Cool. Yeah. All right. They were ordered to take no prisoners. Fire Dragon Bright. It's gonna do whatever he doesn't. <laughs> are you gonna willfully take a negative point just to make sure that I do? Or are you gonna take a point? What are you Man, it feels like it should be a paint color. But how many how many times do they name stuff dragon? I don't know. Fire dragon seems too generic. Yeah, I'm gonna go with movie so I can make sure that I fail. I'm I'm gonna go with paint color. Sam is correct. <laughs> <laughs> See, I use Army Painter. This is why. <laughs> well, mostly because it's cheaper. But <laughs> yeah, that's true. Throne of Blood. <laughs> oh, oh. Oh, I don't want to see this movie if it is a movie. All right, I'm that's, going paint color. Um, Throne of Blood. That's right down. That's like a, some chaos lords, like top coat or something like that. I don't yeah. know. Um, I'll go with movie. All right, so you said movie. He said he said paint. <laughs> Sam takes another one. <laughs> <laughs> Throne of blood. Got oh it. man, Chat. Right, yeah, so it's a Somebody war hardened me. general, egged on by his ambitious wife, works to fulfill a prophecy that he would become lord of Spider's Web Castle. It's a 1957 8.1 star. That's actually 8. pretty highly stars. rated. Stars. Wow. Yeah. All right. It's, it's got kind of terrifying. on it, probably. The Fang. The Fang. <sighs> I know White Fang was a movie, but it's pr it a little bit more popular. It seems weird to have a paint color just called The Fang. Talk about Citadels here, man. It's kind of weird to have a paint color called Blood for the Blood God. Yeah, but that's like a quote from like a bunch of their stuff. So... You don't know the quote, The Fang? Mm. What's in that closet, Mommy? The Fang. I'm gonna go with the movie. <laughs> I'll stick to it. I'm going the opposite. I'm going with paint. It's working for you. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it so... I guess it's... Is it supposed to be... Uh, oh, it's, it's so it's blue. It's like a grayish blue base color. I don't know. Yeah, I have. <laughs> Have I got any right? I got the ones right that we were together. Knife Blue. in the water. Knife in the water. Movie. Oh, yeah, I got to go with movie on this one. All right, yeah, you're both correct on that one. So. Did Sam get any wrong? Yeah. Sam got one wrong, but we both got it wrong we at the same time. So this is a 1962 thriller uh, about people that go on a sailing trip, an aging husband and wife invite along, an emphatic young hitchhiker, out of sheer patronization. I don't yeah. know what that you means. It looks you don't do odd, that. but yeah. You let's, don't let's take a hitchhiker on. When you're our, going on, on a sailing trip. trip with your husband and your with a husband and wife, you don't it invite was, a third wheel. It was nineteen sixty two. Crime hadn't been invented yet. So <laughs> oh yeah. Zamesi Desert. That's uh, paint. I'm gonna do paint too. All right, yeah. You guys are both correct. And I believe this is the last one. Iron Breaker. Oh, paint. Paint, yeah. Ah, man, I, I ended on two I easy ones. I use Iron ones. Breaker a lot. Yeah, I was, I mean, after I, I put it on there, I was like, oh, you've been I, painting those. I paint Necrons, like, come on. Oh, that's I love, true. I love <laughs> paint, yeah, I love painting um, models that have armor on them. Right. They're just, they're just a lot easier to paint, so. Mm -hmm. so. Awesome. So in the game of tones, you either win or you die with a Y-E. Because <laughs> colors. <laughs> that's All right, cool. so that's, that's our game. All right, The Superman. winner was Sam with nine. 
And I don't Roy, even want to hear it. Roy with a close second at negative three. <laughs> oh, I, we went into the negative? Yeah, oh. I was taking points when you were wrong. Uh, that's cool. Uh, so it was the final score was nine to negative three. It was close though. Sam got ten out of fifteen right. The not me, the guy there. He says he thinks he, he did okay. Uh, Kabuki says that was an amusing game, very amusing, and he doesn't paint. So another person said that uh, she doesn't paint rather in April. So well done. All right, I think we have more contributors coming up. So let's get to it. Howdy folks, welcome by the numbers. My name is Hunter Thomason from the Family Showdown. This week's topic, do people buy new games anymore? With the increased popularity of Kickstarter and all the pre-orders going on, you can pre-order from online stores. Lots of friendly local game stores allow you to pre-order games. You can even pre-order from many publishers' websites. Couple this with the other end of the spectrum, second-hand games. There is online auctions, there's online marketplaces, there's the board game geek marketplaces, there's bazaars, math trades, all sorts of convention exchanges going on. You can even get games in back alleys. So I was wondering what percentage of games people buy brand new. So I put a fantastic little poll over on the Dice Tower Facebook page and the results are in. Let's take a look at the handy dandy chart and we see that the vast majority of people still purchase their games new, but I found it very interesting that almost 20%, 18.94% of people purchase less than 50% of their games new. Even more interesting, less than 3%, 2.65% of people purchase 100% of their games new. Maybe even the most interesting thing is that nobody, surprisingly, nobody buys 0% of their games new. I figured there'd be somebody out there that was exclusively Kickstarter or secondhand. But no, there's still people buying new games. So what portion of your games do you purchase brand new? Are you that elusive 0%er that I'm looking for? That white whale? Leave it down in the comments and we'll see you next time. Happy breakfast everyone. Today I'm going to talk to you about a few games I'm really excited about to see at UK Games Expo 2019. Now the first game I'm excited to see comes from Foxtrot slash Renegade Games and it's the full name Lantern's Dice Lights in the Sky. Now I'm a huge fan of the original one, the tile placement game, but this is dice rolling and there's also sort of Tetris polyomino style tiles so I'm intrigued by that alone. Uh, next up, Snowman Dice, and that's by Brain Games. I really like some of the other Brain Game games, uh, a bit like uh, Ice Cool. I think that's an absolutely wonderful game. This one, you're building a snowman out of dice. Other people can try and roll snow snowballs and somehow take you out while you're pushing your snowman along. It sounds weird, wonderful, and everything. Uh, the next one, Sumo Gnomes. Now, this one comes from Peculiarity. Uh, I've not heard of them, but it's a game that's supposedly super portable and plays in one to five minutes, uh, where you're going to be trying to like spin, kick, and do sumo related things as gnomes, I'm assuming. Uh, another dice one, uh, and that's the final dice one on this list uh, Imhotep the Jewel from Cosmos. I like some of these ones that sort of take a two to four or whatever player game and condense it down uh, that, that makes it a really sort of nice couples game one on one um, that you don't necessarily always miss having those extra players. And the last one from uh, Simon, come on, call many or not, whatever you want to call them, Zombie Side Invaders. It's, you know, it's Zombie Side in space with aliens. I can't see much going wrong with that. You know, I, uh, I maybe prefer sci-fi over fantasy, uh, so we'll see how that goes, but I'd at least love to get a look at the actual game. Anyway, that's a rapid fire five games. Let me know what you're looking forward to in the comment section below if you're going. Maybe I'll see you there, and I'm Oliver East, signing out.
All right, we have your surprise mm -hmm. unboxing coming. Uh, it's a, not a surprise for us, though. It's a giant box. It, but it is a huge old Mungo box. Uh, and this is, says, is Dead Throne, World of Velez. So the artwork looks, hmm. It, yep. A little bit generic. <laughs> it looks, hmm. Looks a little bit generic, but um, it is a heavy, big, heavy box. Yeah, I'm interested to see what all is in here. I haven't looked at this at all. And so there's a lot of stuff in there. So let's go ahead and just take a look. I hope it's okay that we're doing this. We didn't have anybody tell us before they left that we could not open <laughs> some new things. So hopefully uh, there's a unique insert here. There's a rule book. Seven card trays. Goodness, you get a hernia lifting this thing up. My goodness. Oh, wow. I bet you it's that tray. Ooh. It ha oh, wow. Wow, well, that smell. Yes. <laughs> Does this, is this supposed to stay in here? Huh, this is kind of interesting the way that the box is in different parts. This is like not coming out. So I'm thinking that this is supposed to stay in here. Really? Huh. It doesn't come out. I mean,. You oh, can, yeah, it looks like it's, it's glued down. It's like glued down. But oh, that's kind of yeah, interesting. Let me show that to people real quick. That's the inside of the box, and it's glued in. So, hmm. I wonder if that's part of the mechanics. Yeah, I wonder if it's functional. It's functional. Well, look it up, Kendi. Well, and this then we have all of this is stuff. interesting. Huh. The miniatures are. Not bad. Oh, that's awesome. I guess. Why? What is it? So apparently it you put up. you put things in here because this is the market, and you can slide this and open and close the market. Apparently, I don't know. Maybe in theory. Oh. So it's like, oh, it's closed. And then you can slide this down and it'll open it up huh. to let things go in and out of there. But it's actually part of the box itself. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, these these characters are kind of generic looking, um, like super generic fantasy looking. Oh yeah. But um, like it, you know, dude with a beard and a hammer. I must say, what are you, Z Garcia now? <laughs> uh, they are like quite a bit bigger than like no, yeah, normal they're, miniatures. They're bigger than normal miniatures, yeah, and they have decent detail on them. But I don't know, they just have that a weird mm -hmm. feel and look to them. That it's gotcha. kind of eccentric. But not necessarily in a, in a very they're good way. They're like slightly cartoony and not right. like yeah. they're like exaggerated features a little bit. But that's pretty cool. Yeah. And these are I don't know what these are like maybe wound boards or something like mm -hmm. that. All right, what else is in here? I want to see what actually goes in that thing. Sorry, I pulled the tom. Sorry. <laughs> cool. So there's lots of different cards here. Some gems. That Some graphic design blocks. though is banging some wooden hexagonal pieces uh some wooden dice that's not bad they look pretty cool and some plastic dice that are custom they have letters on them okay these are the card trays that they were taught whoa oh that's crazy so the cards can just be put in stand here. up in it Here. Is this a, just a spacer or? No, there's oh, tiles. That's holy the smokes, board. those are huge. Huge tiles. Those are extremely large. I wonder how many of these you use during a game. I don't know. You have the rule book right in front of you, sir. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, some of the artwork on the inside of the rule book again is kind of uh Those not, are gigantic, not, like not what you're expecting. Look, one, two, three, quite four, large. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Looks like ten maybe. That's a setup. Oh wow. So ten of those things, that's a huge That's a footprint. huge footprint. <whistles> maybe this is a play it on your table board or play it on the floor board game. 
So you can move. Uh, looks like you can move like these different. Um, I don't know. Some of them have things that look kind of like spaces on them, right. but other ones, it's kind of hard to tell if they're actually like spaces that you move around. Right. Huh. That's a big rule book. But yeah, I like, I think these are like the different, maybe they correspond with different tiles and things like that, but I like that they have the little boxes that hold the different cards. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. But this, they're kind of open on the end. You said this is a Kickstarter, right? I don't know for sure. I don't know for sure. It looks like it. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like it. It looks like a definite Kickstarter. Uh, the rule book has that. Ooh, dice. Has that look to it. All right. Well, word are we gonna make? Um, Dow. Almost looks like Dow. Yep. I guess that's a D. Or sure. Dow. That maybe that's a V. Interesting. I wonder. Okay. Nice. Well, that is uh, Dead Throne, the world of Veles. This is probably not going to go here. Oh, here's all your character cards. They have the nice 3D renders on the cards for the uh -huh. characters. Yeah. Awesome. Well, okay. <laughs> okay. I don't, <laughs> I don't know exactly how to say, not knowing how a game, how the game plays or anything like that. So I mean, this I is, am this interested cool. to see how this works. Yeah, that's cool, but I don't know if it's gonna, uh, if it's just gonna be turn out to be too cumbersome. Yeah. Um, it doesn't slide the best. Makes it kind of interesting to actually. Oh, there we go. Oh, that's how you know that it's actually closed. Trace. You done playing with it, Roy? Yes, I'm done playing with it. Okay. <laughs> oh, let's see here. Oh, how wooed. All right. All right. So, well, that was our uh, unboxing. Have we got more contributors or? Yep. More Lambda spread. All right, here we go. More contributors for you guys. Hi folks, my name is Andy and welcome to Portable Gaming, the show about games which are fun to play in pubs and cafes. So today I'm going to talk to you about Chupacabra Dice, another game by Steve Jackson which involves rolling dice, which is something I've realised I'm a lot more of a fan of than I, than I thought. I bought this game simply because a friend of mine couldn't say Cthulhu and thought it was Chupacabra every time. I googled it, found out it existed, and was pleasantly surprised when I started playing it. The game is simple, you and up to three of our players will grab six dice. You will roll those dice and you will build herds of the different creatures that you see on them. So you have chupacabras, you have chickens, goats and bulls. Once you've built those herds together, you will then try to eat your opponent's herds. So I'll put a little chart above me. One chupacabra can eat one, one up to two chickens, can eat one goat, or two chupacabras can eat a bull. And when you eat your opponent's creatures, you gain those dice and then you roll them again. And you keep rolling and battling off until you're the only person with dice left. Now, that sounds like a few cardinal sins. It's purely dice rolling, there's no mitigation, player elimination, and yes, all of those things. But it is daft. It is fun. It is the kind of thing you can frantically just roll and go, ah, I'm going to eat your chickens, I'm going to eat your goats, ha <laughs> ha, give me that bull, and so on, and back and forth. And I've played games where I've had one, one dice, and that's been enough to bring me back on a small combat streak to get like 10 dice, and find them back and forth, and back and forth. And it is, it's silly. It is fun. It's definitely more for the pub than the cafe, and the dice are glow the dark, which is annoyingly cool. I'd recommend it. It is it is fun, and not everything, as I've said, has to be too tactical. This can just be a bit of daft fun. Um, comes in the same sort of cardboard tube, but because you're mostly rolling without that, you don't need to worry about that taking a battering. Maybe dice trays or a confined space, so you don't lose everything. But yeah, I'd recommend it. Tube of cabra dice. Anyway, thanks very much. I've been Andy, and I'm pretty sure it's your round. Hi, I'm Jordan, this is Second Chance Shelf, where I take a look back at an older game and see why you should take it back off your shelf. Today we're looking at the classic route building game by Alan Moon, 10 Days in the USA. Let's see what's inside.
in the game you are trying to connect a route across the United States starting in one state and ending in another state. On your turn you either draw one of the tiles from the face up discard piles or one of the tiles from here and then you must put it in to a space on your rack and then discard that one to one of the discard piles. You're going to keep doing that until you have a completed route from one state to another state. There are also airplanes here that allow you to connect, uh, they're colored, they connect you between the same colored states, and there are also cars that let you drive through a uh, state as well. So the first person to have a completed route announces it and then shows it to the rest of the players. You then take everybody through your route. So if I go from Nevada to California, up to Oregon, and then I can fly to West Virginia since that is also yellow, Kentucky, I can drive through the state of Tennessee down to Mississippi, back up to Tennessee, and then end in Missouri. And that is how you play 10 Days in the USA. Well, there you have it. There's a little bit about 10 Days in the USA. Um, it's kind of like glorified Racco. Instead of putting numbers up and down in your rack, you're putting states across in your rack. Uh, there's a couple wrinkles with the cars and the planes um, and the way the states are positioned. Um, it's also got a little bit of that uh, Rolling America feel where you're trying to connect the states to each other. But ultimately, I mean, this one's been in my collection for a long time. really like to pull it out with family. Um, I think it's really great. So again, I'm Jordan. Happy breakfast. All right. Well, that about sums up our board game breakfast live today. We hope you enjoyed it. We do have some more things that are coming up. Uh, you... So that you have some stuff coming up. What is it? I have a video that I did. I we played Twilight Imperium four this past oh, okay, Saturday, yeah. and I um, put piece. I videoed a little bit of that. Put that together. That's going to be coming up a on bit Saturday. Of a mini vlog. And just like a, it's not like a playthrough or anything like that. Just like yeah. our thoughts on a little bit and showing yep. us playing the game. Yep, that's cool. Um, we've got. I've got a review of Memoir Forty Four New Flight Plan coming up this weekend. I believe on. Saturday, so you can check that out. Uh, we're going to be at uh, Simon Expo uh, in Atlanta, Roy and I. So uh, if you're going to be there, we'll see you there. Jim said he's he'll see see us tonight, so we're looking forward to that. And yes, please do leave Stockpile at home this time. Um, <laughs> thank you, we appreciate that. Uh, <clears throat> we uh, the guys are at uh, you know Tom is here at uh, UKGE. Mm -hmm. So if you're over on that side of the pond, then uh, go say hi to them. Say hi to us in Atlanta. And uh, next week, we've got our regular gamut coming up, uh, Testing Tuesday on Tuesday. And yep. then, uh, we've got a crowdfunding. No, I'm sorry. Crowd, crowd surfing, surfing. Coming up. We've got another top 10 coming up next week. Um, well, I believe we also have a playthrough of um, the Dwellings of Eldervale. I gotcha. believe that's what it's called. The Dwellings of Eldervale. Um, it's a pretty neat thing. I actually played a prototype of it on the cruise earlier this year. Oh, awesome. And uh, me and Mark Street sat down and had a good time with it. That's coming out from Breaking Games. So oh, that, cool, cool. That's going to be an interesting uh, playthrough, I think. So uh, I believe that's coming up this next Friday. So a week from tomorrow. Anyway, that's it. We'll uh, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to uh, uh, hammer through some of this stuff with us. We appreciate it. I'm Sam. I'm Roy. We'll see you guys on the flip side. Take care. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.